Welcome to Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston history. This is episode 25, The Court Martial of Paul Revere. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. This week, we're going to talk about Paul Revere. The 18th is the anniversary of his famous ride, and I'm sure we all know the Longfellow poem that made Paul Revere famous. We want to talk about a different story, a story that takes place four years after Revere's famous ride, and that will earn him infamy that takes a very long time to shake. Well, listen, children, and you shall hear a different story of Paul Revere. In Maine, the troops fled before a British drive until hardly a man was left alive. They court-martialed Paul in 82, I fear. But before we talk about the failed Penobscot expedition and the court-martial of Paul Revere, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Marathon Monday is April 17th. And on April 17, 1865, Boston City Council held a special session in memory of President Lincoln, who'd been shot the previous Friday. Mayor Frederick Lincoln, no relation, opened the meeting with an address that reflects how unexpectedly the nation had to shift from exulting in the triumph of the Union to mourning the loss of their president. The death of one so distinguished whose eminent services for the last four years have been so valuable to his country, and whose individual opinions and actions were considered so vital to his future welfare, has filled the nation's heart with gloom. In the midst of the jubilant and excited feelings of a grateful people, bound to him with dearer ties than ever before in his career, his connection with them has suddenly been severed by the violent hands of an assassin. The fresh joy of the recent glorious victories of our armies, securing, we trusted, Peace and prosperity to a reunited country has unexpectedly been turned to mourning. We'll link to the entire transcript of that meeting in this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 025. On April 18, 1689, the provincial militia marched on Boston, taking the royal governor prisoner as he attempted to escape to the safety of a British warship anchored in Boston Harbor. The governor was Edmund Andros, who personally ruled all of New England in the name of the king after the original colonial charters were vacated. He raised taxes, promoted the Church of England in favor of local congregationalism, and dissolved the provincial legislature. Needless to say, he did not endear himself to the locals one bit. So when they got word of the glorious revolution back in Old England, when William of Orange invades and then takes the crown, the citizens of Boston were ready for a revolution. After their bloodless coup, Andros is locked up at Castle Island for a year, then eventually shipped back to the mother country. The colony eventually receives a new charter from William and Mary in 1691. If you want to learn more, listen to our show on the 1689 Boston Revolt. We'll link to episode 6 in the show notes. Wednesday is April 18th. After the marathon bombings on Boylston Street in 2013, Boston was suffering from a broken heart. During an interfaith service at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross on April 18, 2013, Mayor Tom Menino rose from his wheelchair and, through obvious pain, delivered an address meant to help us heal. No adversity, no challenge, nothing can tear down the resilience in the heart of the city and its people. I have never loved it, this people more, than I do today. We have never loved it, this people more, than we do today. In that clip, it's obvious why we called him Mumbles Menino, but just as obvious why he was so beloved. Nobody wears their love for this city and its people on their sleeve the way Tom Menino did. We'll link to a recording of that address and a transcript for anyone not used to Mayor Menino's unique speech patterns in the show notes this week. In happier marathon history, the very first Boston Marathon was run on April 19, 1897. The first modern Olympics had been held in Athens the previous summer, and it sparked something of a running boom. The manager of the U.S. Olympic team, John Graham, was a member of the Boston Athletic Association, and he came home keen to run a marathon here in Boston like the one he had seen in Athens. Working with the BAA and a businessman named Herbert H. Holton, Graham set out a course from Metcalfe's Mill in Ashland to the BAA's track in the Back Bay. There wasn't an accepted distance for the marathon at that time, so the race that first year was only 24 and a half miles. 
10 runners managed to finish. It wasn't until 1924 that the starting line was moved to Hopkinton and the race was standardized at 26 miles, 385 yards. The finish line has since moved from the BAA's Irvington Oval to Boylston Street, and your humble host, Jake, managed to stagger across that line during the 120th running of the Boston Marathon last year. In this week's show notes, we'll link to a Runner's World article about how the course, and especially the finish line, has changed over the years. Friday is April 20th, and on April 20th, 1775, Patriot leader Joseph Warren, your favorite Patriot, wrote a letter to Thomas Gage, the military governor of Massachusetts. The tensions between the colonists and occupying British troops had broken out into fighting the day before at Lexington and Concord, and the British were now besieged within Boston. Warren wrote to Gage in an attempt to set terms by which adherents to each side could cross the lines around Boston and be reunited with their families. Against that backdrop, Warren closed the letter in a surprisingly warm, almost wistful tone. I have many things which I wish to say to your excellency, and most sincerely wish I had broken through the formalities which I thought do your rank, and freely have told you all I knew or thought of public affairs. And I must ever confess, that whatever may be the event, that you generously gave me such opening, as I now think I ought to have embraced. But the true cause of my not doing it was the knowledge I had of the vileness and treachery of many persons around you, who, I supposed, had gained your entire confidence." We'll link to the full text of that letter in this week's show notes. Abigail Adams opened her letter to John on April 21st, 1776, with a little bit of good-natured teasing about his concise letters to her. I have to acknowledge the receipt of a very few lines dated the 12th of April. You make no mention of the whole sheets I have wrote to you, by which I judge you either never received them, or that they were so lengthy as to be troublesome and in return, you have set me an example of being very concise. I believe I shall not take the hint, but give as I love to receive. Then she went on to engage in a bit of gloating over the fate of the Boston loyalists who had recently evacuated to Halifax. We have intelligence of the arrival of some of the Tory fleet at Halifax that they are much distressed for want of houses, obliged to give six dollars per month for one room, provisions scarce and dear. Some women, some of them with six or eight children round them, sitting upon the rocks crying, not knowing where to lay their heads. Just heaven has given them to taste of the same cup of affliction which they one year ago administered with such callous hearts to thousands of their fellow citizens, but with this difference, that they fly from their injured and enraged country, whilst pity and commiseration received the sufferers whom they inhumanely drove of from their dwellings. We'll link to the full text of that letter in this week's show notes. On April 22nd, 1868, a new town was incorporated in Massachusetts. Portions of land were set off from the surrounding towns of Milton, Dedham, and Dorchester and organized into the new town, which was called Hyde Park. Hyde Park would remain an independent town until 1912, when it became the last town to be annexed to the city of Boston. Today, it's the neighborhood your humble hosts call home. In the show notes this week, we'll link to the act of incorporation, where you can read the quaint style of surveying that drew the town's boundaries from a point in the field northwest of E.W. Capon's house and measuring 115 feet on a course south, 87 degrees east from an oak tree. Sunday is April 23rd. On April 23rd, 1938, a ship called the City of Salisbury sank in Boston Harbor. The night before, it had run aground on an uncharted rock near Graves Light in the outer harbor. On board was a cargo of 40 pythons, 40 cobras, 20 crates of exotic birds, a Himalayan bear, and over 300 monkeys. The animals were safely taken ashore as the ship was very slowly broken up before the bow sank the next morning. You can hear the full story of the zoo shipwreck in Episode 9 of Hub History. We'll have a link to the show, as well as some pictures of the wreck, in this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 025. When we think of Paul Revere, we usually think of his famous ride, which had an anniversary on Tuesday. Meanwhile, in Boston, 
the British were preparing to march to Concord after the Patriot weapons. 1,000 soldiers had gathered on the banks of the Charles River, ready to cross the river to the road to Concord. But the Patriots had discovered the British plan. Already, Paul Revere was galloping across the countryside, spreading the news. The British are coming! The British are coming! However, it's easy to forget that Paul Revere's story didn't end on April 18, 1775. This week, we want to bring you a story about Paul Revere that's not so wrapped in myth. In 1779, Revere commanded a military expedition in Maine that ended with the greatest U.S. naval defeat prior to Pearl Harbor, and eventually led to his court-martial on charges of cowardice and insubordination. After the British evacuated Boston in March 1776, Paul Revere returned to his Boston home and was commissioned as an officer in the Massachusetts militia. In November, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel of Artillery and posted at Castle William today's Castle Island. As one of the fort's top commanders, he made many improvements to its defenses and armaments. In a funny turn of events, he was able to increase the fort's firepower by taking the guns from the wreck of the Royal Navy's HMS Somerset. The Somerset was one of the ships that had guarded the mouth of the Charles River when Paul Revere began his famous ride by rowing across the river under its guns. In the meantime, it had been wrecked near Provincetown, and 21 of its guns were taken for use by the Massachusetts artillery. Revere was intelligent and resourceful, but also gained a reputation as an abrasive personality, prompting a number of complaints against him. And despite his modern reputation as a revolutionary hero, he had no combat experience prior to the fiasco in Maine, and had little experience leading men in the field at all. His unit had deployed once in 1777 to escort prisoners from southern Vermont back to Boston to be detained on prison ships, and once in 1778 as part of a combined French-American attack on the British in Newport. However, the battle was called off before he saw action because the French fleet was scattered by a storm. In June of 1779, a large British fleet landed at the Penobscot Bay in Maine, and claimed a crown colony called New Ireland. The name made sense as it sat between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, or New Scotland, on one side, and New England and New Hampshire on the other. About 700 soldiers, mostly Scots, began constructing a fort they called Fort George on a peninsula that's today occupied by Castine, Maine. Their plan was to establish a military stronghold, as well as settling the area with loyalist families who'd been driven out of other parts of the colonies. After landing, the British commander proclaimed that all who shall return to that state of good order in which the whole must end submit, and within eight days take the oaths of allegiance and fidelity to his majesty, would not be harmed. Anyone who had settled the area informally could apply for a royal land grant, and fishermen were free to ply their trade without harassment. The troops were ordered to be on their best behavior and not to undertake any pillaging against the locals. After the militia realized that they were hopelessly outmatched, the British campaign for hearts and minds seems to have met some success. In the coming weeks, 651 local residents appeared before the British general and swore allegiance to the crown. Many more decided to stay silent and neutral. Some patriots and militia officers fled south. There was no organized resistance. Keep in mind that Maine belonged to Massachusetts until 1820, and many people still alive in Massachusetts in 1779 could remember the series of colonial wars fought by the British and the Massachusetts militia to seize control of that territory from the French. Massachusetts officials were not thrilled by the idea of having the British seize their hard-won territory, invite loyalists to settle it, and create a new military stronghold just across the Gulf of Maine from Boston. Clearly, the proud Massachusetts Council couldn't bear this insult, and they couldn't risk leaving an enemy outpost in their own backyard. As dispatches arrived in Boston describing British efforts to build a fort on the Penobscot Bay, a committee reporting to John Hancock vowed to launch a major expedition against them within six days. Speed was vital to strike before the fort was completed, but it also meant that the Massachusetts men were overconfident. In fact, they barely bothered to consult with the commanders of the Continental Forces. As Continental Surgeon James Thatcher would write, Such was their zeal and confidence of success that the General Court neither consulted any experienced military character 
nor desired the assistance of any continental troops on this important enterprise, thus taking on themselves the undivided responsibility and reserving for their own heads all the laurels to be derived from the anticipated conquest. Massachusetts may have been eager to claim credit for the expected success in Maine, but they did need Congress's help for one thing, ships. At that time, we still had our own Massachusetts State Navy, but in 1779 it consisted of just three armed vessels. The Continental Navy happened to have three more ships anchored in Boston Harbor at that moment, and the Council managed to convince them to join the expedition. The Council then searched up and down the Massachusetts coast, looking for any armed ships they could lay their hands on. They enlisted one ship from the New Hampshire Navy, and many privately owned vessels from Newburyport, Salem, and Boston. Some owners could be paid for their assistance, and others had to be threatened with impressment. In at least two cases, Massachusetts sheriffs seized vessels for use in the expedition, when the owners wouldn't cooperate. Why were there so many heavily armed private vessels in Massachusetts ports? Remember that one man's pirate is another man's privateer. Privateers were privately owned ships authorized by the state to attack British flag vessels. Then the ship's owners and their crews would sell off the cargo and divide the profits. Between the state navies, the continental ships, and the privateers, by July the fleet consisted of 20 armed ships with 324 guns between them. There were an additional 21 unarmed transports of various sizes, mostly schooners and sloops. This was the largest naval force the Americans managed to assemble throughout the entire war. Remember that most of our naval victories during the Revolution came thanks to the French and their powerful navy. When the fleet was ready to go, the commander of the naval force, Commodore Dudley Saltonstall, must have felt pretty good about his chances. Intelligence said that the British only had three ships hanging around Penobscot Bay, so with 41 ships and a strong ground force, the odds seemed to be in the Americans' favor. About 1,500 members of the Massachusetts militia were mobilized for the attack on Fort George under Brigadier General Solomon Lovell. Though the militiamen were from all around the state, the city of Boston provided a disproportionate amount of officers and funding. Along with this group, about 100 were called up from the artillery, who received the following orders on June 26, 1779. Ordered that Colonel Revere hold himself and 100 of the matrosses under his command, including proper officers in readiness at one hour's notice to embark for the defense of this state and to attack the enemy at Penobscot under the command of General Lovell. Along with the three continental vessels, Congress provided a contingent of continental Marines to bulk up the invasion force. I had a hard time nailing down an exact number but it seems as though there were several hundred Marines who sailed with the fleet. Paul Revere had a checkered history at best with the Continental Marines. In March of 1779, just a few months before this expedition, he had become enraged when the Marines enlisted some of Revere's colonial artillerymen. He complained first to the Massachusetts Council. I lay these matters before your honors, hoping something may be done to put an effectual stop to such proceedings, for it is in vain for us to recruit men if the Marine officers may take them from us. Weeks later, he went as far as firing on the Providence, which, to be clear, was an American warship, in order to get his artillerymen, then known as matrosses, back. His note to the Massachusetts Council said, Castle Island, April 9th, 1779. Sir, I have received out of the Providence frigate 15 men, then sent 10 of them on shore, but I was obliged to fire at and bring her to before I could get the other five. So not only is this another example of Revere's abrasive personality, it also probably means that there was some bad blood between the Marines and Revere's artillery before the battle even began. There seems to have been more than enough bad blood between the officers involved in the expedition. Dudley Saltonstall, captain of the Continental ship Warren, was named Commodore of the Fleet. He would be in command of all the armed vessels, as well as the Continental Marines. Meanwhile, Simon Lovell was named General of all the militia forces in the expedition. Like Revere, he also had little or no experience leading men in combat. Lovell was saddled with a second-in-command named Peleg Wadsworth. Wadsworth, grandfather of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who would make Paul Revere famous, undermined Lovell by publicly disagreeing with many of his decisions. 
Paul Revere was also ordered to bring along an officer with whom he had constantly quarreled at Castle William, Major William Todd. To cap it all off, Saltonstall reported to Congress, while Lovell reported to the Massachusetts Council. There was no overall commander of the expedition, and the highest-ranking officers did not have to listen to one another. A few nights before the battle began, the officers held a council of war, which Paul Revere recorded for posterity. It was an epitome of the whole campaign. There was nothing proposed, and of consequence, nothing done. It was more like a meeting in the coffee house than a council of war. There was no president appointed, nor any minutes taken. After disputing about nothing for two hours, it was broke up. With the benefit of hindsight, it seems obvious that the expedition was headed for disaster. On July 19, 1779, the fleet sailed from Boston with orders to captivate, kill, or destroy the enemy force, and arrived before Fort George on July 25th. The fort was still incomplete. The earthworks were under construction, the main walls only five feet high, and only two guns were mounted. Work crews of soldiers and local residents who were pressed into service labored in the summer sun. They dug trenches, cleared trees from the fields of fire around the fort, and built a batis, a pre-barbed wire obstacle made from sharpened tree branches half buried with the pointy end toward the enemy. As predicted, only three British ships guarded the harbor. The odds were overwhelmingly in favor of the American expedition, and the British general privately said that he expected his men to make but the pretense of resistance, expecting to be captured at once. Lovell pressed for an immediate attack, but Saltonstall was unwilling to risk his fleet against the guns of the British ships while dealing with the treacherous tides of Penobscot Bay. Nine Patriot ships exchanged fire with the three British ships for several hours, with minimal damage on both sides. That night, Lovell attempted to land seven boats near the fort, but had to call it off due to unfavorable tides and winds. The next morning, 150 Continental Marines landed at Nautilus Island and captured a British battery there. Revere's artillery could then fire at the British ships, forcing them to withdraw closer to Fort George and leaving the channel undefended. On the 27th, the decision was made to land on the peninsula and lay siege to the fort. The attack began at midnight, with Paul Revere ordered to land with the men under my command as a corps de reserve to the general, to leave my cannon and take my muskets. The landing was uneventful, and by the evening of the next day, Revere's matrosses were hauling cannons up the bluffs to Patriot positions around the fort. They began bombarding the fort while a combined force of Massachusetts militia and Continental Marines stormed some outlying British positions. At this moment, the Patriots managed to seize a defeat from the jaws of victory. General Lovell's ground troops were within a hundred yards of the British fort. The defenders only had a handful of functional artillery pieces and were outnumbered. However, the British ships on the harbor could still fire on the open ground around the fort to suppress any attacks on it. Lovell refused to storm the fort until Saltonstall engaged the ships. Saltonstall had little confidence in the officers and men of the militia and didn't want to risk his fleet for no reason, so he refused to engage the ships until Lovell's men had seized the fort. Lovell ordered his men to begin digging approach trenches, trying to push his artillery far enough forward to batter down the half-constructed walls of Fort George. Commodore Saltonstall and General Lovell finally agreed to begin a joint assault on August 14th. Unfortunately, disaster arrived the night before the assault was to take place in the form of a British fleet. At first, Patriot forces believed that the sails they saw at sunset on August 13th were Continental ships maneuvering. Then the fog lifted. There were seven heavily armed British warships coming into the harbor to augment the three that were already there. Commodore Saltonstall had no illusions that his naval force could prevail against the British fleet. He had a numerical advantage, but the Royal Navy was the best trained, best armed, and most feared Navy in the world at that time. The siege party was ordered to break camp quickly and fall down to the ships. With a strong British fleet in the mouth of the harbor, the only option seemed to be to try to outrun them by sailing inland up the Penobscot River. The armed boats quickly outsailed the transports, but one by one, all the American vessels fell. Several were captured by the pursuing British, 
but many more were burned after running aground in the rush to sail the treacherous river. As each ship ran aground, the crew and soldiers aboard would take to the woods. The last few ships were burned near Belfast, Maine on August 16th. The entire fleet, the strongest the Americans pulled together during the entire revolution, was lost. During the chaotic retreat, Paul Revere had the poor fortune to cross paths with both Solomon Lovell and Peleg Wadsworth. While on a barge attempting to gather his men for the retreat, Revere ran into General Lovell. Lovell ordered him to gather his artillery and fire on the British ships to cover the retreat. Revere would try to comply, but could not rally enough matrosses to man the guns. He was later ordered by General Wadsworth to give up his boat to allow the crew of a disabled ship to be rescued. Tempers flared and harsh words were exchanged. Revere initially refused the order, but eventually complied and handed the boat over to Wadsworth's men. At this point, without direct orders, Colonel Revere led two officers and eight men into the Maine woods. They walked to Fort Western at today's Augusta by August 19th. Revere's journal says that he then, after supplying them with what money I could spare, I ordered them to Boston by the nearest route. Up until they fled into the woods, the Patriot Army had suffered 130 casualties, killed, captured, or taken prisoner. The march back to Boston would cause 474 more. Because of the haste and disorganization of the initial retreat, most men had little or no food. In many cases, they had no weapons or powder, and in some cases, no shoes. All their supplies had either been abandoned or burned. Our retreat, wrote one soldier, was as badly managed as the whole expedition had been. Here we were, landed in the wilderness under no command. Those belonging to the ships unacquainted with the woods only knew that a west course would carry us to the Kennebec. General Wadsworth tried to rally the troops and make a stand against the British. He gathered the men and artillery he could find along the river, but soon realized that it was a hopeless position. He didn't know it, but General Lovell was only about five miles upriver, also fruitlessly trying to gather the scattered militia. His efforts also failed, and he was finally forced to order every man to shift for himself. With this, the army began wandering south toward Boston. Revere also made the hike, arriving back in Boston on August 26th. He was able to send word ahead of the defeat. A dispatch from Portsmouth read, Lieutenant Colonel Revere this moment arrived from Penobscot. He informs us that the whole of our shipping is destroyed, with all the provisions, ordnance, and ammunition, and the whole army deserted and gone home. I refer you to him for particulars, who sets off for Boston this evening. So the Penobscot expedition, which many Boston sea captains and financiers had expected to be a huge payday for their privateer vessels, turned into a complete loss. People in Boston were looking for a scapegoat. Ten days after he arrived back in Boston, Paul Revere was relieved of his command at Castle William and placed under house arrest pending an investigation. He immediately began pursuing a court-martial. It was common at the time for an officer who was accused of misdeeds to demand a court-martial in order to clear his name. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, there were numerous charges of cowardice and dereliction of duty. After taking command of the army at Cambridge, George Washington spent months hearing court-martials for officers who believed themselves to be falsely accused. In that spirit, Revere wrote to the Massachusetts Council, Were I conscious that I had omitted doing any one thing to reduce the enemy, either through fear or by willful opposition, I would not wish for a single advocate. I beg your honors that in a proper time, there may be a strict inquiry into my conduct where I may meet my accusers face to face. The Massachusetts Council convened a board of inquiry led by General Artemis Ward in September 1779. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it found that Massachusetts Generals Lovell and Wadsworth bore no responsibility for the mission's failure. Continental Commodore Saltonstall, however, was from Connecticut. The Board of Inquiry was happy to lay the failure at his feet, saying it was due to a want of proper spirit and energy on the part of the Commodore. On September 28th, he was tried at a court-martial aboard a frigate moored in Boston Harbor. He was found guilty and dismissed from service. The Board of Inquiry did not find that Paul Revere was culpable for the disaster in Maine. 
It didn't clear his name either. In fact, the board's report didn't mention Paul Revere at all. He wrote another letter asking for his case to be heard, and the Board of Inquiry reconvened in November 1779, holding hearings in the east lobby of the State House. Their report had mixed results for Lieutenant Colonel Revere. Number one, was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Revere criticizable for any of his conduct during his stay at Fort George or while he was in or upon the River Penobscot? Answer, yes. Number two, what part of Lieutenant Colonel Revere's conduct was criticizable? Answer, in disputing the orders of Brigadier General Wadsworth, respecting the boat, and in saying that the Brigadier had no right to command him or his boat. Number three, was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Revere's conduct justifiable in leaving River Penobscot and repairing to Boston with his men without particular orders from his superior officer? Answer, no, not wholly justifiable. This was not the outcome Revere was hoping for, so in January of 1780, he again wrote to the council asking for a court-martial. Twice I have petitioned your honors, and once the House of Representatives, for a court-martial, but have not obtained one. I believe that neither the annals of America nor of Old England can furnish an instance, except in despotic reigns, where an officer was put under an arrest, and he petitioned for a trial, although the arrest was taken off, that it was not granted. The complaints upon which my arrest was founded are amongst your honor's papers, and there will remain an everlasting monument of my disgrace if I do not prove that they are false. Is there any other legal way to prove them false than by a court-martial? He wrote at least five more letters before finally being granted his wish in 1782. On February 19th, he was able to argue his case before a court-martial of 12 captains, presided over by General Wareham Park. There were two remaining charges. One, for refusing to deliver a certain boat to the order of General Wadsworth when upon the retreat up Penobscot River from Fort George. Two, for his leaving Penobscot River without order from his commanding officer. After reviewing the testimony and evidence available, the court referred its findings to the president of the Massachusetts Council, John Hancock, for approval. Colonel Revere having closed his defense, the court, after maturely deliberating on the whole evidence, proceeded to make up judgment as follows. 1. The court finds the first charge against Lieutenant Colonel Paul Revere to be supported, to wit, his refusing to deliver a certain boat to the order of General Wadsworth when upon the retreat up Penobscot River from Fort George. But the court, taking into consideration the suddenness of the refusal, and more especially, that the same boat was in fact employed by Lieutenant Colonel Revere to effect the purpose ordered by the General, as appears by the General's deposition, are of the opinion that Lieutenant Colonel Paul Revere be acquitted of this charge. 2. On the second charge, the court considering that the whole army was in great confusion and so scattered and dispersed that no regular orders were or could be given, are of the opinion that Lieutenant Colonel Revere be acquitted with equal honor as the other officers in the same expedition. After nearly three years, and having been dismissed from the militia, Paul Revere had finally cleared his name. His honor was restored. He never served in the military again, instead returning to his ventures as a silversmith. Paul Revere may have been a decent dispatch rider, but I don't think he was a great militia officer. After the war, Paul Revere would expand his business empire. Branching out from being just a silversmith and engraver, he began making cast iron goods, then bronze, including bells and cannons. Eventually, he mastered a technique to make rolled copper in a factory in Canton, Massachusetts. The State House Dome was originally clad in Paul Revere copper, as was the USS Constitution after an 1803 refit. Today, the town of Canton is developing a new Paul Revere Heritage Museum on the site of the Canton Mill. Coincidentally, Paul Revere's auspiciously named grandson, Joseph Warren Revere, was himself court-martialed during the Civil War. After the disastrous Union defeat at Chancellorsville in 1863, the federal government was looking for a scapegoat. When his commanding officer was killed in an advance against Confederate lines, Brigadier General Revere ordered his men to pull back three miles in order to regroup. In Washington, Prudence could be seen as cowardice, so Revere was court-martialed. 
He was cleared of the charges, but resigned from the army. Perhaps we'll save that parallel story for a future episode. Last week's show about the infamous Parkman murder sparked some conversation on Twitter. First, our regular listener, Alexander Hamilton, at the A.Ham, described the show as a grisly story this week to tickle one's macabre nature. And a listener named Tim reached out to say, Great episode. Is the Commons Parkman bandstand named after him? First of all, thanks. And yes, sort of. The Parkman Bandstand and the Parkman Plaza, where the Visitor Center is, are named after George F. Parkman, the murdered George Parkman's son and heir. Tim also included a link to a possible ghost story about the Parkman family. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Speaking of show notes, to learn more about the Penobscot Expedition and the Court Martial of Paul Revere, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 025. We'll have a link to a biography of Paul Revere that includes his papers and diary from the Penobscot Expedition and his testimony before the Board of Inquiry. We'll also link to a book called The Court Martial of Paul Revere, which I swear I hadn't heard of prior to naming this episode. We'll also have a link to a description of an abatis, as well as an article tracking the process of creating the Paul Revere Heritage Site in Canton. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We are at Hub History on Twitter and at facebook.com slash hubhistory. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the contact us link. And while you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. That's all for now. We'll be back next time with a show about Isaiah Thomas, the colonial printer of the Massachusetts spy, not the NBA star and his flight from Boston before the outbreak of the Revolution, printing press in tow.